Shalom, everyone. In the Nazarene, that's what we're called. There's something for the masses to see, and then there's something for the initiated to see. It's the darkness hiding in open view. We call them Wiccans, witches, warlocks, wizards, shamans. That's what they go by. It's poison doctrine. After 2730 years, we are free to know who we are. All the lost sheep will come to their senses. The awakening will travel far. After 2730 years, our punishment has been lifted. I can open my eyes and see crystal clear. No more fumbling around in the dark. After 2730 years. Hello. Everybody, I'm Lou White, and I'm here to discuss something that is actually the, the keynote of the ministry of, it should be the keynote of every minister, the ministry of all the Nazarim, and that's the same thing that Yahusha himself was engaged in, that's the restoration of the lost sheep, the lost tribes of Israel. The tribes of Israel are actually uh, 13, technically, 12, uh, if we count Yosef as one tribe. Uh, the Yahudim, or the Jews, are one tribe. They're the royal tribe, the royal line. And the firstborn blessing was placed upon one of Yosef's sons, Ephraim. Well, the lost tribes are out in the nations right now. And they're in the world, and they don't know who they are. They're like the prodigal son. They've forgotten themselves. And Yahuwah is calling them back to his household, which is his covenant. So this is a restoration project about, you know, restoration of the, of the tribes of Israel back to the covenant. And they're going to learn the covenant again, and it's going to produce in them the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit is, of course, you know, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, nine things that obeying the commandments actually produces. And the first four commandments are problematic for most Christians because they really don't understand them. They're not studying them. And that's what we're here to do is to, to study them so that we can get restored to them again. And the Ten Commandments are in fact called the covenant of loving kindness. The Hebrew word is hasid. And it's mentioned in 1 Kings 8, 23, and 2 Chronicles 6, 14, and Nehemiah 1, verse 5, the covenant. Now, the scattered tribes of Israel, what does that mean, scattered? Well, it means they're not in the land. They were given the permission to be and remain in the land as long as they were obeying the covenant. Now, the moment they stepped out of the covenant and added to it or detracted from it, then they were cast away from the land. And that happened in two basic, uh, well, actually three expulsions. The exodus from Egypt brought them back to the land after 40 years. And then uh, that was their first introduction to actually living in the land as a nation of Israel. And then they were taken away around 722 BCE by the Assyrians, or scattered mostly, but then some were taken away too, to Assyria. And then 135 years or so later, the Yahudim, the southern house, of Yehuda was taken away by the Babylonians for 70 years. And then about 10% of them came back and remained until around 70 CE when they were completely taken away from the land again. And uh, they remain in captivity. Now captivity means that they're not in the covenant and they're not allowed to come back until Yehusha himself regathers them. And he says when he regathers them, they're not going to be in any fear anymore. They're in fear right now because the United Nations is who regathered them. In, uh, for the last days, the man who was renamed Israel, his first original name was Yaakov, the brother of Esau. In Genesis 49, it says, and, uh, it says, and Yaakov called his sons, that means all the tribes' heads, the fathers of the tribes, gather together so that I declare to you what is to befall you in the last days? Gather together and hear, you sons of Jacob, and listen to Yisrael, your father. And that was 
what he said. He, you ought to read that. Now, in Yaakov, the man named Yaakov, who was brother, uh, the brother of Yahushua, they called James. In verse 1 of his book, he says, or his letter, Yaakov, servant of Elohim, and the master of Yahushua, Messiah, to the twelve tribes who are in the dispersion, greetings. So that's the greeting uh, right there at the beginning, opening line of his letter. He's addressing the letter to the twelve tribes who are in captivity, in the dispersion. And in James 5, or Yaakov 5, verses 7 and 9, so brothers be patient until the coming of the master. You're not to regather yourself. See the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You too be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the master has drawn near. So he's writing to us too. Not only was the first Yaakov writing to us, but the second one was writing and saying the same thing. He's talking to us who are in, in the dispersion or the captivity. And that captivity is among the nations of the world. We're all over the place. And this is uh, addressed to, or to overcome a blindness that's blocking our comprehension uh, because a lot of people that are seeing this for the first time are going to be thinking, oh, it's just Jews and Christians and Islamic people. But it isn't. A lot of those, all in those groups are all mixed up, lost tribes of Israel. Uh, before you can fully comprehend this information, a certain blindness has to be lifted from your mind. The blindness is the fact that the tribes or descendants of Israel don't know who they are because they're lost. They're lost to themselves. The word Israel must never refer to the land or even a government. It's a nation of people, the families or clans or tribes, who live in the covenant with Yahuwah. So if you're an Israelite, by blood, but you're not in the covenant, then you can't really claim that name anymore. But you can claim the name of your tribe, but that's about all. The lost tribes are their descendants living among the Gentiles scattered upon the earth. But a remnant will awaken and understand here in the last days. So there's going to be a time here in the last days when a remnant of the lost sheep will actually understand. And that's what the prophecy says. Israel has been blinded in part while scattered among the Gentiles, and they're blind to the covenant and to their own identity. Romans 11 tells us, for starting in verse 25, For I do not wish you to be ignorant of this secret, brothers, lest you should be wise in your own estimation, that hardening in part has come over Israel until the completeness of the Gentiles has come in. Now what's he saying? He's saying that Gentiles who think they're Gentiles are coming into Israel. They're not the land, but the covenant. That's the way you engraft until the completeness or the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel shall be saved as it has been written. The deliverer shall come out of Sion and he shall turn away the wickedness from Yaakov. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So the tribes of Israel are scattered across the face of the earth and they're living as Gentiles, believing that they are Gentiles. And that is a stronghold or a false idea. It's a prison that people are, are trapped in. What is a stronghold? A stronghold is a false belief or a notion. Strongholds can be broken by being exposed by the truth which sets us free from the stronghold. Once exposed by the truth, the lies have no more power over us. A stronghold can blind us from understanding. In 2 Corinthians 10, starting at verse 4, for the weapons that we fight, for the weapons we fight with, are not fleshly, but mighty in Elohim for the overthrowing of strongholds, overthrowing reasonings, and every high matter that exalts itself against the knowledge of Elohim, taking captive every thought to make it obedient to the Messiah and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is complete. So he's really referring to us as obeying something. 
And the truth is what sets us free. People are not conscious of the fact that they are imprisoned in many layers of contrived thoughts that are designed to keep them controlled and keep them in sin. They're mentally imprisoned by what they have accepted to be truth. As long as they continue to believe the lies are truth, the fortresses that imprison them will hold them securely. Messiah Yahusha sets us free by guiding us into the truth. So if we believe that we're going to be benefited by uh, doing something that some man made up, such as a sacrament, that's not in the scriptures. Something that they're told is going to imbue something special in their heart or their lives that isn't real. It's an artificiality. It's a stronghold. It's just made up. It's something that they believe, but it isn't helping them at all because sacraments are non-existent. They aren't real. Uh, the word Israel refers to only Jews. That's a stronghold. That's not true. Because the word Jew is less than 500 years old and refers to any descendant of one tribe, Yehuda. That's a man, a man named Yehuda. The first time the word Yahudim, Jews, is used in scripture involved a war that was between the house of Israel and the house of Yehuda. The house of Israel was the ten tribes in the north after the tax revolt after Solomon. And then they were fighting the house of Yehuda. They were fighting each other. So there were ten tribes fighting against two tribes. And the first time it is mentioned is in 2 Kings 16 verse 6. To mislead us, the enemy of our beings, who's the dragon, the dragon has always been the enemy of Israel and the enemy of the Nazarim, has set before the nations his prophet. The adversary, Hashatan, has a prophet, the false prophet. And it's an office of authority which has been established to oppose or mislead the set-apart people. The elect or the children of Israel are called Kodeshim, that means the set apart ones. If you're in the covenant, then you're set apart because you have a relationship between Yahuwah and yourself. You know, there's a relationship. But uh, a lot of Christians are saying, I want that personal relationship. But there's only one personal relationship that Yahuwah has offered. And that is through the mediator of the covenant, Yahusha, the covenant is the is the relationship so you obey the Ten Commandments mediated by Yahuwah who writes them on your heart and that is your relationship <clears throat> so the children of Israel are all 12 tribes here we go now what did the false prophet promote about who Israel is now people believe this and that's why we're trying to expose it to the light. The term Israel has been misapplied to Christians who are not obeying the covenant. They believe they might be but they don't know that they are, are not. It's a Gentile religious movement that developed without the Torah but embraced the Messiah. So it's all about the Messiah but it's not promoting what he teaches or brings with him. The term spiritual Israelite helps further confuse the sheep. Because what is a spiritual Israelite? Well, it's hard to say. Because it's not anything that we can learn from, from, from Scripture. You're either in the covenant or you're not. Anybody can join. Now, this is one of the false prophets of the Supreme Roman Catholic Magisterium. That's all Roman and Latin stuff. Uh, he's just one of many. This is one. He's wearing white robes. And this system, or beast, the system is the beast, deceives the nation with a false method of salvation through contrived sacraments, which they teach imparts grace to the common people through their priesthood. And it's a hierarchy. The congregation of Yahuwah is all the people, not just the people that are ruling over the, the masses, because there's not supposed to be any of us ruling over one another. There's not supposed to be a separation between the ones that are running the show and the ones that are not. It's actually a giant circus, is what it really is. Here's some of the false prophet teaching. The eternal covenant is said to be annulled or superseded by the authority of the circus. Their circus has more authority than the written word. 
That's what they say. They celebrate the death of Yahushua, which is not what we do. We don't celebrate the death of Yahushua HaMashiach each time one of their deceived priestcraft officiates at a mass. This mother circus is the woman who rides the beast in Revelation 17 and 18. And it thinks to change times in Torah. If you see Daniel 7.25, you'll see that the fourth beast that's mentioned in Daniel and Revelation is changing the Torah and the set-apart times that we're supposed to I mean Sunday where's that written in Scripture you know where's Christmas or the bunny rabbit thing that's not there but the festivals of, of Yahuwah that was given to Israel are all superseded but we're to be restored to those here in the last days I mean, I'm not being hateful about people. I'm just talking about the teachings. Now, the, let's research the term Nicolaitanes in your own time. Look it up in a dictionary or an encyclopedia. Nicolaitanes is a word that means to, to conquer the people. Laity means people. The conquerors of the people, the ones who lord over the people. And there's not supposed to be anyone doing that. Yahushua said he hates the, the Nicolaitanes. Now, replacement theology, that sounds like a big term. What does that mean? Well, it means that Israel has been replaced with another, per, uh, another group of people. And let me explain it. Through the centuries of false teaching, the nations have been lulled into thinking the original covenant with Israel has ended and that Yahuwah has given up on the original 12 tribes who they think are Jews. It's not just Jews. It's, you know, all the lost tribes. Ephraim and Zebulon. This replacement, the replacement of the covenant theology holds people in the belief that Christianity, specifically Catholicism's brand, has now become Israel. I asked my father, who was raised in Catholicism, I asked him who Israel is, and he said it's Catholics. That's because he was told that. Israel is not Catholics. Uh, they have to engraft. They have to become Israel. But uh, they're not becoming Israel until they engraft into the covenant. Now, they, they, it also states that the Jews are synonymous with the old Israel <laughs> and that the new Israel, who are Christians, do not even have to live according to the old covenant. Now, that's the teachings of the Circus Fathers. You know, Epiphanius, Tertullian, Jerome, guys like that. They said that. That's who said that. Not, not Yahuwah. The founders of Christianity said that. It was uh, founded at the uh, Catechetical School of Alexandria, Egypt, and these men were formerly sun worshipers, and these men were uh, what they call the CHURCH fathers, and they're, uh, re they're studied by the seminaries, the, all their writings, and they basically say that the uh, Nazarim are heretics because the Nazarim are the original followers of Yahushua. If you read uh, Acts 24, verse 5, they say that Yahushua, the Messiah, has set them free from the law. In these things, they misunderstand and mislead millions of, of living descendants of the tribes of Israel. They themselves are descendants of Israel, but they are kept in this deception. The people themselves that are teaching these things and receiving these teachings are actually lost tribes themselves. Is it a rebellious heart that's keeping them in the deception? That if they were willing to open their heart and submit to Yahuwah, then that deception would fall away. That's true. If they were able to uh, overcome, that's what overcoming is all about. You uh, overcome the deceptions by acknowledging that these generic terms like, you know, L-O-R-D and G-O-D. These are strange references to the Creator. But his real name, they do not want. You know, that's a danger to them. And just a year or so ago, the false prophet actually told us, told the world, that we are not allowed to use the name Yahweh as he understands it. Now that's very strange teaching, and it wouldn't be coming from anybody like our Messiah. Yahushua would never say, don't call upon that name when you come together. 
what would, who would say that? You know, because the adversary knows that things are getting very short and, and, and the information about his work, the deeds of his uh, deception is actually being revealed. Now Israel is to become the fullness of the nations. That's prophecy. The Messiah spoke of the coming deceptions in Mark 13, 22. Quote, for false messiahs and false prophets shall rise and show signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, even the chosen ones. The elect, or chosen ones, are the descendants of the tribes of the man, Yaakov, who was renamed Israel, which means ruler with El. That's what the term Yisrael means. Now those chosen to inherit the covenant were eventually to become an uncountable number and to become a company of nations. And that's given at Genesis 35, 11 and 48, 16. And even to the ends of the earth, Deuteronomy 33, 17, Psalm 98, 3, Isaiah, or Yeshiahu, 41, verse 9, 43, verse 6, 49, verse 6. So if the covenant is not believed to be in force right now, but there's a new one that replaces it, where would we find it? Well, let's look at uh, the fact that Yahuwah says that the covenant is forever. Yahuwah's covenant with Israel will never end. Now that's a sure thing, because if you read Yermiyahu or Jeremiah 31, verses 36 and 37, you'll see that. He took Israel to be his wife at Sinai. That was a marriage at Sinai. He clearly said that Israel would live in the land, but only on the condition that she kept his covenant. While not in fellowship with Yahuwah, through that covenant, Israel would be scattered until they turned back, to, and that would be turning back to the covenant, and they would turn back to it while they're among the nations in the latter days. So in the latter days, we're going to come back to the covenant and start walking according to the Ten Commandments. And that's confirmed by all the prophets. See Amos verse 9, Zechariah 10, Ezekiel 37, Yermiyahu or Jeremiah 3, and, verse, and chapter 16, and all of chapter 31. Yermiyahu 31 is very, very important. Read that whole chapter. Now, redemption, the redemption is our, uh, when we actually get born. Because right now, we're begotten. We've received a portion of his seed, being the Ruach HaKodesh, the spirit of Messiah in us, to change our minds and viewpoints. So the return of the lost tribes is going to happen when we're redeemed and we're born. Because the whole universe is groaning for our redemption and our, and our appearance as the sons and daughters. Zechariah 10 verse 9 says, Though I sow them among the peoples, they shall remember me in places far away. They shall live together with their children, and they shall return. Now, that sounds like they're going to do it on their own power, but actually other prophecies show clearly that Yahuwah is going to snatch us. Now, Amos 9 verse 9 says, For look, I am commanding, and I shall sift the house of Yisrael among all the Gentiles, as one sifts with a sieve, yet not a grain falls to the ground. He's not going to lose track of us. And in the last days we will reawaken. Yahuwah speaks to those living right now about who they are. Yahuwah says we will obey in the latter days while among the Gentiles. At Deuteronomy 4, which is really great, Deuteronomy 4, 5, and 6 give us a big giant picture of all of our, uh, the scattering and regathering. In Deuteronomy 4, he reminds us of his covenant once again and repeats the covenant at Deuteronomy 5. And he tells us that we will again remember the words of Torah in the last days. Notice the, this one sentence. Deuteronomy 4.30, in your, in your distress, that means your tribulation, when all these words shall come upon you in the latter days, that's the words of the covenant. Then you shall return to Yahuwah, your Elohim, and shall obey his voice. That's how you return to Yahuwah, is by obeying his voice. When all these words come upon you in the latter days, 
And then notice, this is reflected again in Deuteronomy 30, starting, well, the first 20 verses. And it shall be when all these words come, come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you shall bring them back to your heart among all the Gentiles, where Yahuwah your Elohim has driven you, you shall turn back to Yahuwah your Elohim and obey his voice according to all that I command you today with all your heart and with all your being, you and your children, then Yahuwah your Elohim shall turn back your captivity. They're not going to turn it back themselves. And you shall have compassion on, and he shall have compassion on you and he shall turn back and gather you from all the peoples where Yahuwah your Elohim has scattered you. Now, when will Yahushua return and why? His disciples or students of Talmudim ask him, when will this happen? When will these things happen? And Matthew or Matthew chapter 24, uh, I think, phrases that question and he explains it. Yahushua will return when the fullness of the Gentiles is restored to the covenant, since the Gentiles as a whole are the lost scattered tribes, the descendants of Israel. We must not attempt to regather ourselves to the land before the proper time, since our being scattered is the consequence of our not living according to the covenant. When he has restored us to his covenant, then he will return to gather us. Why? Because we are his inheritance. That's what scripture says. So if we go back to the land of Israel before we're regathered, if we're standing on the soil of the land of Israel, that's the land of Israel, that's the people, then we are, we're still in captivity. And so there's going to be rockets flying at us and people blowing themselves up to kill us. So he didn't say to go back to the land. He said, wherever we're scattered, we're to return to his covenant. Now Israel's inheritance happens to be Yahuwah and his covenant, or his Torah. That's the word for instructions, how we're to live. The restoration to Torah is now underway. The regathering will occur at the end of the great tribulation. The end of the great tribulation, or the great distress. When he returns to reign forever on the earth. See, it's a matter of him coming to the earth and not uh, us going to heaven, as many people understand. He will then restore Israel into one stick and the house of Israel will be united under him as one people. And that's seen in Ezekiel 37. For now we are to be a light to the Gentiles to awaken them to their idolatry and prof profanation of the covenant, but also to their heritage, Yahuwah and, and his covenant. The prodigal son parable is about the lost tribes of Israel who left the father's household which is his Torah, or his covenant. Now the retelling of the covenant for the tribes in the last days is right here. Let's go through that because whenever we meet together, we're instructed by Yahuwah to speak of them when we rise up and when we lie down and when we come in and go out and walk along the way or sit in our home. Now number one is, I am Yahuwah, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim, out of the house of bondage. You have no other mighty ones against my face. Number two is you do not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of which is in the heavens above or which is in the earth beneath or which is in the waters under the earth. You do not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, Yahuwah your Elohim, am a jealous El. That means mighty one. Visiting the crookedness of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing kindness to thousands to those who love me and guard my commands. Number three, you do not cast the name of Yahuwah your Elohim to ruin, for Yahuwah does not leave him unpunished who casts his name to ruin. Number four, guard the Sabbath day to set it apart as Yahuwah your Elohim commanded you. Six days you labor and you shall do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of Yahuwah your Elohim. You do not do any work you nor your son nor your daughter nor your male servant nor your female servant nor your ox nor your donkey nor any of your cattle nor your stranger who is within your gates 
so that your male servant and your female servant rest as you do, and you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Mitzrayim, and that Yehua your Elohim brought you out from there by a strong hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore Yehua your Elohim commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Now these are the ones that uh, Christians and witches don't mind at all. Those first four are a problem though. Now, res number five is respect your father and your mother as Yahuwah your Elohim has commanded you so that your days are prolonged so that it is well with you on the soil which Yahuwah your Elohim is giving you. Number six, you do not murder. Number seven, you do not break wedlock. Number eight, you do not steal. Number nine, you do not bear false witness against your neighbor. And number ten, you do not covet your neighbor's wife, nor do you desire your neighbor's house, his field, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, his ox, nor his donkey, or whatever belongs to your neighbor. Now, Yahuwah has hidden the lost tribes of Israel among the Gentiles. If you read all of Yeshayahu, chapter 49, and Ezekiel, or Yehezkel, and uh, you'll find out that the, the whole of Ezekiel, or Yehezkel, is about the scattering and regathering plan. So the whole book starts off explaining how he's going to, to, they're going to break the covenant, he's going to scatter them, and then at the very last days he's going to re regather them. Now, it also mentions how uh, the plan that he has for, for his people to whom the Gentiles must engraft. And, that, and that's through the covenants. If you read Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 through 13 and Romans chapter 11. So the Gentiles must engraft to Israel. The, the, uh, the Christians believe that the Jews have to become Christians. And that's not at all the, the case. It's just the opposite. If you're alive, then you're most likely a lost, cut-off descendant of the tribes of Israel. And when you repent and take up the covenant again, through immersion into the name of the Mashiach, Yehusha of Nazareth, you become an Israelite. That's what you're really becoming. You're enjoining yourself to Yahuwah through his covenant, calling upon his name for salvation. And you become a member of the Nazarene. Now, if you read Acts 24, verse 5, that's what we're called. The Nazarene are branches or offspring or descendants. It also means watchmen or guardians. The renewal of the covenant is described, the renewed covenant is described in Hebrews chapter 8. And it's repeated at chapter 10. And Yahuwah is our Savior, our Redeemer. And we call him Yahusha. And it means Yah is our Deliverer. That's what Yahusha means. Or Yahushua. All flesh shall know that I, Yahuwah, am your Savior and your Redeemer, the Elohim of Yaakov. That's Yeshayahu chapter 49, verse 26. Uh, you can't wiggle away from it very easily. It's telling you who he is. That's the uh, Aleph and the Ta. Now the tribes that are gathered at the return of Yahusha, here they are. Dan, Asher, Naphtali, Menasha, Ephraim, Reuben, Yehuda, Lui, Benjamin, Shimeon, Ishakar, Zebulon, and God. And these are listed at Ezekiel 48. Okay, that's what the, you, the, you know, the book of Ezekiel is about. The scattering and the regathering. So the regathering, these tribes are mentioned. But in, in uh, one case, Ephraim and Dan are not sealed with the name of Father Yahuwah. Although they're regathered, they're not sealed for protection. Because Ephraim and Dan are highly idolatrous, even now, even in the last days. And so when we're sealed with the name, a lot of them will not receive it until they have to go through the tribulation. And that's what this is all about. In Revelation 7, verses 4 through 8 explains what these are, all, are what's going on here and I heard the number of those who were sealed the ones protected 144,000 sealed out of the tribes of the children of Israel. these are not Christians 
but they might be Christians that are being sealed and they're no longer Christians. They become Nazarene. Of the tribe of Yehuda, 12,000 are sealed. Of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 are sealed. Of the tribe of Gad, 12,000 are sealed. Of the tribe of Asher, 12,000 are sealed. Of the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 are sealed. Of the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 are sealed. Of the tribe of Shimeon, 12,000 are sealed. Of the tribe of Louis, 12,000 are sealed. And of the tribe of Yishakar, 12,000 are sealed. Of the tribe of Zebulon, 12,000 are sealed. Of the tribe of Yosef, 12,000 are sealed. Of the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 are sealed. Now, technically, Ephraim is sealed in part because Yosef is mentioned, and Ephraim is one of his children. But because of the fact that by name he's not mentioned, it's kind of strange. But then Manasseh is mentioned, and he's the other son. See, Yosef had the sons Ephraim and Manasseh. Manasseh is mentioned, and Yosef is mentioned, but where's Ephraim, you know? So Dan is not in this list of the ones that are sealed, which is kind of creepy for Dan, because he's got to go through something unprotected. And I can't explain the Ephraim thing very, very well, but he's not, his name's not in the list, unless you want to just include him, because Yosef's mentioned. And he is firstborn, so. Or he received the, the blessing. So we are in captivity right now among the nations and whether we're in New Zealand, Australia, India, China, wherever we might find ourselves, we're still in captivity. And 1948 was not the regathering. It may be that it is signaling something that's important, but it's not the regathering itself. Uh, those Israelites that are in the land just prior to the regathering are to flee to the mountains, which means flee to the nations. And the, tribe, the tribes of Israel were scattered repeatedly and permanently scattered in 70 CE by Titus. When the temple was destroyed by Titus, all due to their unfaithfulness. But the faithfulness of Yahuwah to his covenant is steadfast. The tribes that are in the land since 70 CE are not the fulfillment of prophecy. Today we see the nation of Israel regathered by the will of the United Nations. And the United Nations plan after World War, World War II was to annihilate the, re the remaining Yahudim on the planet. Uh, it was a UN plan to see the Yahudim annihilated by her enemy neighbors, the Ishmaelites and Edomites and Assyrians and Moabites. You know, you, you hear the, the, the hatred in those nations that are around them all the time, like the leader, the president of Iran, you know. Now, in um, the book of Ezekiel, we hear of a great feast of Yahuwah. Now, at the time of the ultimate regathering, we're going to have a feast of Yahuwah just prior to that. But the ultimate regathering will be incredibly wondrous. It's going to be the second exodus. When, when the Israelites came out of Egypt by the strong hand of Yahuwah, that's going to be like nothing compared to what's about to happen when he calls us out of the nations. We're going to rise up into the air and we'll be clothed in immortality and, and it'll probably be during the time the sun is darkened so we'll be the only bright spot around and people will see this happening all over the earth and then we're going to be regathered to meet Yahusha in the air as he returns and we're going to be the probably be the new Jerusalem we ourselves uh, because we're we're called the building blocks or the the stones of the new temple that he's going to make. Now, those who are stubbornly in the land now are still in captivity, having all sorts of problems, and if they remain there, great tribulation is in store for them. Yahuwah stated that Israel would be scattered, and in the latter days they would obey his covenant while still in their captivity among the nations. When the fullness of the Gentiles comes in to the covenant, Yahushua will return and regather them from the ends of the earth. We're not to regather ourselves to the land prior to his return. Otherwise, we'll become part of the great feast of Yahuwah, fed to the birds and the beasts at the end of the great tribulation, just prior to Yahushua's return. And you can read of this in Ezekiel 39, verses 17 through 29. Yahuwah says we will obey in the latter days while we're among the Gentiles. 
in your distress when all these words come upon you in the latter days, then you shall return to Yahuwah, your Elohim, and shall obey his voice. It doesn't say they're going to move their address. It says they're going to return to Yahuwah and obey his voice. And it shall be when all these words come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I've set before you, and you shall bring them back to your heart among all the Gentiles where Yahuwah, your Elohim, drives you, and shall turn back to Yahuwah, your Elohim, and obey his voice. According to all I, that I have commanded you today with all your heart and with all your being, you and your children, then Yahuwah, your Elohim, shall turn back your captivity and gather you. That's what this is about. And if any of you are driven out to the farthest parts of the heavens, from there Yahuwah, your Elohim, does gather you. And from there, he does take you. And that word take is in the Greek, it would be harpazo, which is what Christians get the, the seizing from, you know, the rapture, raptus. Here's the land as it was occupied around 900 BCE during the reigns of, of King Daoud and Shlomo. Uh, we have basically Yehuda and we have the, the river here, and we have Ephraim just above Benjamin. So Benjamin and Yehuda made up the house of Israel, and there's Ephraim, and that was considered the head tribe of the northern tribes. And there's Manasseh, and um, Naphtali, Asher, Zebulon, um, Gad, and Reuben. Anyway, the Philistines were right over here on the, co on the coast, right here, and um, Dan is up there. But why are the tribal lists different uh, in the book of Ezekiel and the book of Revelation? Well, Revelation 7, the pre-tribulation sealing of the tribes with the name of Yahuwah in the foreheads of the 144,000 is for their identification so that they can be protected. But in Ezekiel 48, it lists all the tribes regathered to the land during the millennium, so that's the thousand year reign at the beginning at the, when Yahushua returns, when Dan and Ephraim are restored. So they're restored. Dan and Ephraim are mentioned in the list in Ezekiel 48, but they're not protected. That's the difference. The ten northern tribes of Israel were also known as Ephraim because of the head tribe, but they were also living in a place called Shomeron, which is where we get the word Samaria. Samaria is a little bit of a corruption of the word Shomeron. So they're called Samaritans. That's the name of the ten tribes given to them because they lived in a place called Samaria. And Omri was one of the kings that lived in, there, in northern Israel that set it up. The, the, you know, the, the establishment of the government of northern Israel. And it's all, we can call it Samaria for people to understand it better. That's where the Good Samaritan was referred to. Anyway, they were scattered over 2,700 years ago by Assyria. Many towns of Yehuda, which is in the south, were also attacked. So those who were displaced were not limited to only the 10 tribes. So all 12 were somewhat involved. Slightly over 14,000 were captured by the Assyrians. Now that's less than 1% of their population because probably 99% of them just fled. And they kept hammering them for decades. So many of them went into the Mediterranean by ship and wound up at other colonies of Israel like Tarshish or Carthage or Kiryoth. Uh, and there were many other colonies around the inner Mediterranean. Yes? And the, by land, many of them went north, and then some of them went to the west, some of them went to the east, and some of them came back around and became the Parthian Empire eventually. So all of them just came to Navia as well as England? And right. There, were, that, there was no doubt about that. Some of them came by land to Germany and Sc Scandinavia. And in fact, the word, very word Scandinavia has the tribal name Dan in the middle of it, Scandinavia. And I believe it was uh, Pliny, a Latin historian, who mentioned the name Scandinavia for the first time. And he used that word because there were so many Danites there. In Denmark, Dan's land, the Danube River, they're, they're waymarks. 
that the tribes left. So they, but they did go by land and they went by sea as well. And uh, there were many uh, coloni colonization phases. But uh, the rest had fled over several, de several decades by land and sea to the west, east, north, and south to distant colonies and new lands or the distant isles. Now take note of that word, distant isles. They became the Gentile nations, which was the great plan of Yahuwah all along. Israel is to become the fullness of the Gentiles. That's the prophecy. So they are actually, they are the, the nations. And Yahuwah shall scatter you among the peoples, and you shall be left few in number among the Gentiles where Yahuwah drives you, and from those few number he's going to grow them, just like leaven inside of bread. And there you shall serve mighty ones, false ones, the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. And, but from there you shall seek Yahuwah, your Elohim, and shall find when you search for him with all your heart and with all your being, in your distress, when all these words shall come upon you in the latter days, then you shall return to Yahuwah, your Elohim, and shall obey his voice. Deuteronomy 4 continues about this scattering. For ask now of the days which, that are past, which were before you, since the day that Elohim created man on the earth. And ask from one end of the heavens to the other end of the heavens, whether there has been a word as great as this, or has been heard like it. Now, why were the children scattered? Because they, were re they, because they rebelled against the words of El, and despise the counsel of the Most High. That's Psalm 107, verse 11. Because they rebelled against the words of Elohim. And they despised his counsel. They departed from the Torah of Yahuwah. <clears throat> according to their uncleanness and according to their transgressions, I have dealt with them and hidden my face from them. False shrine, temple, and priesthood at Mount Gerizim. That was another one. The northern tribes actually set up a false priesthood and a false temple and they worshiped on Mount Gerizim which was actually mentioned in Yahukan or John chapter 4 when Yahushua was talking to the woman at the well she asked him you know what's going on uh, our fathers have taught us that we should worship in this mountain but your people say to worship in Jerusalem which 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 is true and uh, he said, neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will true worshipers worship Yahuwah, but they will worship him in spirit and in truth. The northern tribes also added an 11th commandment in the Samaritan Pentateuch, and this is the 11th commandment that they added. You shall worship Yahuwah your Elohim in Mount Gerizim. So they added to the word of Yahuwah, which was prohibited. Now, if you ask a Christian why do you consider, well no, what do you consider to be the most set apart special day of the year? Or the, what are the seasons of the year that are most special for religious reasons? The answers that they may give you put them in the same apostate situation that Israel found themselves as described above. The physical regathering will not be accomplished by the arm of men, but only by Yahushua at his return. Just read Yermiyahu or Jeremiah 3, Ezekiel 37, and Ezekiel 48. So if you're thinking Israel really messed up back then and were worshiping falsely, then just see what a Christian is doing and ask them, what is that got to do with anything? They've reinvented things, you know, to apply to Yahushua, but he never commanded any of the things that they actually do. And some of them actually know that. So there's a slaughter that's coming on the mountains of Israel. All Israel is currently in captivity, including the remnant that has moved themselves back into the land. Those in the land before the regathering have serious problems ahead for themselves. It's a great feast of human flesh that's coming. Ezekiel 39, starting in verse 17 through 29, says this, And you, son of man, Thus said the Master Yahuwah, Speak to every sort of bird and every beast of the field. Assemble yourselves and come and gather from all around to my offering, which I am slaughtering for you, a great offering on the mountains of Yisrael, and you shall eat flesh and drink blood. 
and the Gentiles shall know that the house of Israel went into exile for their crookedness. And because they have transgressed against me, so that I hid my face from them, and I gave them into the hand of their adversaries, and they all fell by the sword. According to their uncleanness and according to their transgressions, I have dealt with them and hidden my face from them. Therefore, thus said the Master Yahuwah, now I am going to bring back the captives of Yaakov, and I shall have compassion on all the house of Israel, and, I, and, and shall be jealous for my set-apart name. And they shall know that I am Yahuwah their Elohim, who sent them into exile among the Gentiles, and then regathered them back to their own land, and left none of them behind. And no longer do I hide my face from them, for I, sh for I shall have poured out my spirit on the house of Yisrael, declares the master Yahuwah. So uh, wrath awaits those who do not call upon the name of Yahuwah. In Jeremiah, or Jeremiah 10, verse 25, it says, Pour out your wrath on the Gentiles who do not know you, and on the tribes who do not call on your name. For they have eaten up Yaakov, devoured him, and consumed him, and laid waste his home. The whole nation of Israel is actually currently in captivity, but awakening as the prodigal son does in the pigsty, to return to the father's household, and not to the land, but restoration is to his covenant. When the fullness of those returning to Torah is complete, Yahushua will return to receive us to himself. Yeshayahu 8.20 says, To the Torah and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So Israel's mission has always been teaching the covenant to the nations. And uh, Psalm 25.14 says, The secret of Yahuwah is with those who fear him, and he makes his covenant known to them. So that's a very important thing to understand. So there's a secret. The covenant itself is kept secret. Therefore, go and make taught ones of all the nations, immersing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, of the set-apart spirit, teaching them to guard all that I have commanded you. And see, I am with you always until the end of the age. Matthew, uh, Matthew 28. Um, now that's a, almost a, 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 a reconstruction of what was told to Joshua or Yahushua, uh, the, prof, the, the successor of Moshe. Now Yahushua is one who searches hearts and minds, but he's also the one who seeks and saves. And we have to identify who he's seeking to save uh, in the scriptures. Yahushua came to seek and save that which was lost. It says it in Luke chapter 19, verse 10. Now what was lost? The ones, the ones that were Gentiles? Well, if they became Gentiles as a result of being lost, scattered tribes, yes. Now, as his ambassadors today are driven to seek that which was lost, doing the same thing that Yahushua did and is doing, because Yahushua is actually doing this, he's seeking to, uh, using his ambassadors who are driven to seek that which was lost and to raise up the tribes of Israel to the Torah in these last days, even while they're in captivity among the Gentiles. And our deliverer will reach to the ends of the earth to hunt down those who are lost. The prophet Yeshayahu, or Isaiah 49.6 says, it, Shall it be a small matter for you to be my servant, to raise up the tribes of Yaakov, and to bring back the preserved ones of Israel? And I shall give you as a light to the Gentiles to be my deliverance to the ends of the earth. Now this prophecy is, is not just about Yahushua personally uh, when he walked the earth doing that work, but since his coming through his, his disciples, he's doing this same job and he's continuing to do it and even more so as the latter days progress. So it's all him. This text is about him, but he's doing it through his ambassadors. Now, the uh, return and the regathering is an incomparable event. There's nothing that will compare to that. 
it, it approaches closer each day. It's unsurpassed, it's matchless, it's unequaled. Because the regathering of the scattered tribes of Israel, Yahushua's return, is going to be utterly, overwhelmingly amazing. Nothing will ever have happened since the beginning of creation like it. In Yahu or Jeremiah 16, it says, O oh, Yahuwah, my strength and my stronghold and my refuge, in the day of distress, the Gentiles shall come to you from the ends of the earth and say, Our fathers have inherited only falsehood, futility, and there is no value in them. Would a man make mighty ones for himself which are not mighty ones? Therefore, see, I am causing them to know. This time I cause them to know my hand and my might, and they shall know that my name is Yahuwah. That's very interesting. The translators removed his name, of course. But in the latter days, they're going to find out who he is. I mean, they've been, you know, making... Witchcraft is probably the most popular thing right now because the adversary knows his end is near. So the bride, uh, we, a lot of people think the bride of Christ, the bride of Messiah, is actually, who is that? Well, it's Israel. We're going to find that out. But the regathering of the lost tribes scattered over the earth will be a highly dramatic and a noticeable event. And Yahushua, the bridegroom, will be announced, and he will arrive, and he will tread the winepress of his wrath and redeem, that means regather his bride. And our redemption will be the regathering. So who are we? Those who are regathered are the bride, the 12 tribes of Israel. Revelation 21 talks about this. And one of the seven messengers who held the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and spoke with me saying, Come, I shall show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the set-apart Jerusalem, descending out of the heaven from Elohim, having the esteem of Elohim, and her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, that's like a diamond, clear as crystal, having a great and high wall, having twelve gates, and the gates twelve messengers, and names written on them, which are those of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. So do we see anything about Christianity in that, being the bride? He says he's going to show you the bride. It's kind of scary, isn't it? That people miss that. So that's all I have. Is there any questions or discussions? Uh, as far as going back, as far as who is Israel, does that also go back to the sons of God and the sons of man? where you have the descendants from Seth um, as, as far as the bloodline? Well, uh, are you talking about Adam and Kuah's son? Is that who you're talking right. about? Right. Well, because uh, from Seth, the whole uh, bloodline, you know, through David. Yes, yes. Well, the... So, so it includes those people, but then part of the new covenant is basically opening it up to the Gentiles in a spiritual sense. Well, there's a lot of confusion about the spiritual Israel aspect. I don't use that term because it's not really found in Scripture. The way I understand what you're referring to is if you, if you track, track the descendants of Adam and Kuah, the first man and woman, and then through Seth, and then follow all the line, there's a lot of people that probably were produced, and then the Nephilim uh, came along because they, you know, and then, then there was a destruction of every li living creature that breathed air. Okay, now there's a lot of dispute. No, it was a local flood. The flood was only 100 miles or 200 miles or so. But it, that's not true, but that's what people have been told. And I understand that everything on the in face of the earth in the highest mountain was covered by several meters above its height. And so we really have to start rebuilding from Noah, Noah and his wife and their three sons and their wives. 
So we have eight people that we start over again with. See, so uh, if we go back to well, Seth. Is starting over again or continuing with? Well, it's continuing with because Noah was of that line. Yeah, so starting over means that everything right. was gone, but not everything. Noah and his family were right. in existence to keep that bloodline going on. And then, of course, we have uh, through those three sons of Noah, we have, you know, the, the covenant is with Noah and then his sons. And then the ones that departed from the covenant through his children uh, over generations uh, built the Babel, you know, the, the nation of Babel, the city of Babel. And as far as we understand that, uh, they were apostates. And so Yahuwah saw them doing things that they shouldn't have done. And then he further dispersed them into the world because of the confusion of the languages. So that was the first appearance of the languages, uh, differences that we see. And of course, the, the, the new world order is seeking to overcome the Tower of Babel and restore many people to one government. That's what one of their goals, is to overcome the Babel effect, you know, in their logo and poster and everything. But uh, the nations, as we understand the prophecies, through all the prophets, you know, Yahoo, Ezekiel, and uh, Yeshiyahu is particularly, uh, and Deuteronomy, we see that those nations are actually made up of the lost tribes of Israel now. I mean, they're sown into the nations so uniformly in every direction, north, south, east, and west, that there's hardly anybody e that even is alive that doesn't have some seed within them that descends from, certainly, we know that they're of Noah, I mean, we know that they came from Noah. So all the people alive today come from Noah. And, uh, and then subsequently, the, when they went to Misraim and they were in captivity there towards the end and they were delivered, th from there they, they were, you know, for, went back into the land of Israel and then they were dispersed again. So there's been a lot of uh, yeast, uh, not to use it in the idea of sinfulness, but the idea of the, the children of Israel, they went by land and sea in all directions. They found the descendants of Manasha in places in India. And, uh, and in southern Africa, there's some descendants. Of course, when you read, when you watch the History Channel, they, they seem to think that because they see customs being performed, that that uh, in itself is something that manifests itself as, you know, a proof. But that may or may not be so because, but the fact is, I think that genetically the bloodline of Israel is actually in all the nations. And they can be any race. I mean, you know, the, because Yehuda doesn't care about races. A lot of people are, like Darwin was a racist, obviously, if you read his book title, but, you know, the, the superiority of people, uh, racially is is just nonsense there's there's black people that are hateful of white people but and there's white people that are hateful of black people and oriental people and um, and yet we're all one blood just as Miriam the Magdalene anointed your head I'll shower forth praises to you your basora has awoken me up set me free Life's so exciting with you inside me And even though I've only known you these years You've been with me all of my life After 2730 years I am free to know who you are This lost sheep has come to his senses The awakening brought me this far After 2730 years my punishment has been lifted I can open my eyes and see crystal clear No more fumbling around in the dark After two, seven, three, zero years After two, seven, three, zero years